everyone, and welcome to the Book Lounge. Today, we are talking about Willpower Instinct by Kelly McGonigal. Your hosts are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom butler Bowden. So with Book Insights and Book Lounge, what we do is cover books that can advance your work or your life in some way or just expand your mind. Um, and uh, as the Book Insights curator, I'll give my take on each book, why I like it. Um, why we selected it and why it's still relevant and hopefully um, you'll get some sort of deeper understanding of the topic that the book covers as well. That's right so and then I will weigh in on the book update you on the latest news about the author and as always these uh, book insights episodes those are where you go for the in-depth explorations of the best nonfiction books but here in the book lounge it's just an informal chat about the book of the week. And new for this season, we're also starting to bring in guests into the book lounge to interview and join us in the discussion of the book of the week. So this week, we are super excited to have psychologist who has been publishing since 2007 on human motivation. He has lectured in 15 countries on TV and radio. He's helping people achieve their goals along with a blog where he has compiled over 10 years of experience into helping people change for success. Welcome, Dr. Ian Taylor. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Tom, for inviting me. Yeah, uh, pleasure. Um, so, Ian, um, give, tell us a bit about your background and how you sort of got into the whole area of uh, willpower, motivation, self-control. Yeah, so I started um, a PhD in psychology in 2004. And um, that was based around motivation in physical education, school settings. And so how, uh, what was the relationship between teachers' motivation and therefore how they instructed students and, their, and how that impacted on their sort of effort and engagement in, in PE classes. Hmm. And so that was my research area for a few years. Uh, and as Karen said, the first, my first paper was published in 2007. And so I carried on in that, and then, but then slowly, sort of within that PE context, developing a, a bigger understanding of, of motivational processes outside of school and how they impact upon daily life. So dieting, sport, other areas of education, exercise, and things like that. So I, so I've sort of broadened uh, into sort of just looking at motivation in a range of areas. Um, and I've been doing that, yeah, since, since uh, the mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. That's great. Sounds like you're a perfect expert to talk with us about willpower today as we uh, dive into this book. So, but share with us a lesson that has been most impactful to your work and life, something that you could share with our listeners. Um, I think there's one that's quite relevant to, to the book we're going to discuss today, actually, is that uh, the book is going to talk about willpower. Uh, but one of the biggest lessons I've learned and so, uh, through my research and, and stuff that I've read is that if you are using willpower too much, that is a signal that something needs to change. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, so this time of year, everyone is trying to get fit or be healthy in some way. Um, and if it's always a chore and an effort to maybe go out for your walk or your run, then something needs to change. Those sort of motivational foundations need to change. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. So actually, so willpower and using too much willpower is, is, a, is a signal that something needs to change, something about your goals needs to change. What it should be is willpower should be dipped into occasion in, in emergencies. You know, everyone needs a bit of willpower sometimes, but if you dip into it uh, as an emergency uh, fuel rather than your major fuel, I think that's that's probably a good lesson to learn i think that's really Got interesting it. yeah i'd love to know more like so if if we're feeling like it's taking all the willpower we have every day to get our daily walk in what's a like small change that you would recommend you're probably you're probably doing it for the wrong reasons mm -hmm. um and again i think we're going to talk about it in the, in the book but doing it for really valuable reasons mm -hmm. okay so a good example is people who are now going for runs to try and lose weight, okay? There's, there's a big, it's quite an abstract concept, there's a big psychological distance between going for a run or a walk or a cycle and losing weight. 
the goal needs to be a more immediate and more valuable. So just go for a walk because going for a walk is nice. You know, that would be a better alignment. And that will make it a little bit easier and not so reliant on your willpower. Mm -hmm. Because of the psychological distance between going for a run and, and losing weight, you can't, you can't really see, you can't really compute the goal because it's so far away. And so just drawing it in a little bit, I think would be a good idea to, to lose a little bit of willpower. Interesting. Yeah, something I read um, of, of yours, Ian, that you said, I think it was you, that it's better to, instead of sort of telling yourself, um, you know, I, I go for jogs or I go on diets, it's better to say to yourself, I'm a runner or Absolutely. I'm a healthy eater. Yeah. I mean, that, that, yeah, that taps into the idea that um, there's a hierarchy of goals, okay? And B goals are easily accessed. So people want, people naturally, a bit like the instinct of willpower, people have an instinct to demonstrate their identity. So healthy people don't need willpower to be healthy, okay? Healthy people just do, just be healthy. You know, they'll go into the superstar, superstore and they won't need willpower to resist the crisps and the chocolates and so so forth. They'll just go to the, uh, the, the healthy snack and the vegetables and so forth. They don't need willpower because that's who they are. That's the, they're mm -hmm. being a healthy person. Whereas if I'm trying to do exercise or, you know, that's a behavior. And so that's lower down in the hierarchy. And then even worse is having stuff, you know, so, ha you know, ha you know, have doing, doing exercise to um, get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. They're really low level goals they're really poor quality goals interesting so if you like get home from your run and weigh yourself immediately it's not gonna you're not gonna be happy with the results you're gonna lose motivation or you hit on the first girl you see after your run and it doesn't work out you lose motivation Is that exactly. exactly you need to just focus on being healthy and then the, the, the side effects of that will be all the the good stuff yeah, if, if you are a certain person, you don't have to work hard to try to be someone else. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, I mean, that the, the, the phrase I often hear in this whole um, sphere of, of uh, research is that uh, willpower is like a muscle. Um, do you subscribe to that, to that view? Is that a good analogy? Um, it's, well, that is a good question because scientifically, no, um, I don't think it is a good analogy, uh, but it's not a bad, it's not a bad way to think about it. Okay. I think the roots of that phrase came from the science where willpower was seen as that, this limited resource. And if you used it, it would tire out. Exactly yeah. like a muscle. Mm -hmm. I think quite a lot of that now has been is not well supported. Um, there's other reasons, I think. So it's that it's not a limited resource that runs out. It's something else. It's just your priority shift. I think. So so the scientific basis of that analogy of that analogy that phrase is probably is, is probably a little bit shaky. However, for the average person, I think it's you know does it really matter? why willpower seems to sort of deteriorate over time? Probably not. It just, ma it just matters that it is. So I think for the, for the normal person, I think using that analogy, don't use it, to, it goes back to what I was saying before, don't use it too much. Okay. Mm. Because it, you know, there's, 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 a, there's chances that it, you know, it will snap for whatever reason and so forth. But it's not like a muscle. It doesn't. It's not. It's not a resource that tires out. Mm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Because um, that that phrase is plastered all over this Absolutely. area. So it's interesting to hear that. More. So it sounds like it may be useful, but not entirely accurate. Is that about right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. It's, it's useful. Well, to think. Yeah. This is the problem generally with a sort of um, TED Talk bestseller. The merging of science with popular interests is often like phrases like this take off 
with and not necessarily grounded in science. So that's very interesting. Um, shall we shall we move on to the the themes that are actually covered in the book by Kelly McGonigal, and maybe get your take on on some of them. Um, so we've talked a bit about science of willpower already, but um, the thing that she talks about a lot is the how humans have evolved a prefrontal cortex. So we had the older bit of our brains is just related to our drives for, you know, food, shelter, sex, basic things like that. And then later on in evolution, the prefrontal cortex came. And the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that's involved in planning, delayed gratification, reason, etc. cetera. Um, how do you see the, the, that part of the brain, how it relates to uh, what you've studied? Yeah, well, actually, actually, the, the, the book is um, all the, the neuroscience within the book is really interesting because that's a little bit um, outside my area. It's sort of secondary to I sort of look at just people's behaviors and, and, and their sort of overt motives. So actually, that the neuroscience was was really interesting within the book. What it reminded me actually of, of um, was another book. Um, have you uh, some of them might be familiar with uh, the um, I think it's called the chimp paradox oh yeah yeah, yeah. and he, uh, steve peters the author of that talks about the chimp and the computer uh and i think uh, i'm not 100 sure but that's what the the same elements of uh that kelly talk about the the prime the primitive uh amygdala there's, there's, there's desires and the sex and the food versus the cortex which is the rational decision making and planning thing so i think there's I think there's a good sort of basis of evidence for, for those two, that, that idea of that more primitive element of the brain and the cortex, which is driving the sort of more rational thinking. I think, I think that, was a, that's, that seems to be quite a good, solid basis. Mm. But I think, I mean, thinking about that, there was millions of years of evolution. We had this sort of ancient, like lizard-like brain. And then very late in the piece, we got this, the reasoning thing. It just, to me, gives us an indication of just how hard it is, self-control. And whatever we wish or would like to achieve, etc., we are so up against it, you know, in terms of these basic urges. Yeah. Um, even if you've read everything about willpower and etc., cetera, um, maybe even if you're an academic in the subject, <laughs> trying to give up smoking or something, I mean, how far have we got in actually in our strategies that actually work, do you think, that have been successful yeah. with people? I think not very at the minute. <laughs> I think we're getting better. I think this, this field, I think, is moving quite quickly at the minute. Um, some scientific fields are really slow moving, but I think this self-controlled willpower, there's a lot of good researchers in the area, and so we are moving quickly. I think going back to sort of having no chance because of our brains. I think part of it is if you think about the pace of the evolution, you know, real, real slow, you know, changes to the brain mm. compared to the changes of an environment over the last, however, you know, year, few years, hundred years, hundred, couple of thousand, our environment has really changed rapidly and our brain just can't catch up. Our brain is just sort of slowly adapting, but the environment is changing, you know, so our brain isn't, set up to resist walking down your typical high street with burger, chicken, kebab. Um, it, it's just not set up for that. Yeah. So I think we will always be playing catch up. Um, but I think some of the strategies and some of the ideas in Kelly's book are really sound ideas. Some of them are pretty foundational ideas like, uh, you know, sleeping well. Um, and some of them tap into more things that are quite abstract and quite tricky, um, such as, you know, there's, there's elements of being more mindful, you know, being more mindful and, and engaging that cortex, that computer brain to think rationally and be able to resist, I think, are good ideas uh, and good ways to do it. The problem is that takes... Uh, cognitive resources to do that so if you're stressed at home you're stressed at work 
um, your life is stressful for whatever reason, then you're less likely to have the, the, the cognitive resources to be able to engage that cortex and, and resist those temptations. Yeah, yeah. No, I always say that the, the, the time you should be meditating is, you know, the time when you're least able to do it yeah. or, or, or feel able to do it. Um, and I mean, connecting that her, cause she's very big on meditation, uh, Kelly McGonigal, and you come from the side of like sports psychology. So I was interested that one of the things that meditation does is lowers people's heart rate. And in lowering the heart rates, we get less excited. So we, our reasoning side comes in more. Um, so I wondered what you, what you thought of this, um, technique of lowering the heart rate and how that relates to self-control willpower yeah i'd be that was one of the little bit more speculative bits for me in the book because she talks about heart rate variability and which is not necessarily lowering your heart rate it's more the sort of the difference between the the peak of your heart rate and the, and the trough of your heart rate it's more the sort of difference between the beat yeah. and She's right in saying that's a sort of physiological indicator of willpower, but it's a physiological indicator of a lot of things. Um, so I'm not sure whether we are in a position to say lowering heart rate per se or lowering um, heart rate variability will, um, will lower willpower. Uh, we'll, sort of, we'll, we'll sort of enhance willpower, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think that, to, for me, that, that, that would be a, a stretch too far, especially the, the lowering of heart rate and meditation. I think the actual heart rate element of meditation is like, so I'm, I will have a low heart rate, and I don't think that impacts upon whether I am going to sort of give in to a temptation of a cookie, or so I, I struggle to reconcile that idea. Um, the heart rate variability may be an indicator of, 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 um, of willpower. Um, but I, yeah, it, as I said, it's, it, it's not the only thing that it, it, it's, it's uh, labeled with uh, too. So yeah, I, I struggled with that a little bit more, the heart rate element, um, certainly the heart rate element. So if I go for a run and raise my heart rate, am I gonna be more susceptible to temptation? I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think there's any reason, reason for that element. Mm. So I'm not sure about that. The meditation stuff, for other reasons, I could, I could probably buy into um, a little bit more, I think. So you mean if I get a donut on my run, it has nothing to do with the heart rate. It's just, I just decided to get a donut on my run and I can't blame exactly. it on the heart rate. <laughs> exactly. I, yeah, I think, yeah, I would struggle with that. Yeah, um, <laughs> certainly in the actual levels of heart rate. Heart rate variability, maybe a bit more, but again, a little, yeah, a bit too speculative um, for me, I think. I think there's other reasons why meditation helps with resisting temptation. Mm. So um, just to give our listeners a little bit of context in case they're a little lost, they're, you know, not haven't been totally familiarized with what the book is just the the big idea of the willpower instinct by kelly mcgonigal is it's an examination of what willpower is um, and she breaks it down into three types i will meaning like things that you want to do that you will do using your willpower for what you will do uh, i won't using willpower to resist certain things and then i want so using willpower to achieve long-term goals sort of like um dr taylor was talking about of the i want a girlfriend i want to lose weight i want whatever those goals are and sort of delaying gratification until the, that long time when you get them so the book is mostly about how to utilize and improve on this like innate system we all have of willpower um in, in like utilizing it to achieve your own personal goals mm. um yes and um one of the one of the strategies um, i can't remember if it's in the book i think it must be but ian i think you have also um talked about it in your work is this if then strategy can you explain what that is and whether you think it is very you know one of the best strategies yeah, it's certainly a good strategy, um, and it relates to um, something what the Kelly talks about in the book, where 
knowing where or when your willpower is likely to be uh, tested. Okay, so that could be, um, you know, what period of the day is your willpower going to be tested? For most people, um, it's later on in the day, okay, because you've had a hard day at work, because you're more tired or whatever. So um, and we did some, uh, a few colleagues of ours from years ago, we looked at dieters and when they got tempted, uh, tempted and there was a lot more temptation in the evening compared to the morning in dieters, okay. So you can start doing these if-then strategies, okay, and, and, and planning, okay. So if I am tired um, when I get, from, um, get back from work, then I will do this, okay. So your, 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 your goal in the morning might be to go for a huge um, X mile run, okay, um, when you get back in from work. But you know that your willpower is gonna be tested after a long, hard day at work. You've got a horrible meeting with your boss. It's gonna be horrible. So you might not want to do it, okay. So rather than just getting in and slumping on the couch, and putting on Netflix, and an if then strategy would be, okay, I know I'm gonna be tired when I get home from work today. My goal is this, if I can do that, brilliant. If that doesn't happen, can I do something else? Can I go for a walk? Can I do a smaller run? Can I just sit on the home bike instead and so forth? And so those if then plan, plans really sort of help with um, obstacles that are gonna go in your way, you know? Um, so for, you know, you might be, um, another one example might be, oh, I'm good. Well, not now during lockdown, but, um, it might be in the, in, in the future when we're, uh, virus free, that we go out for our friend with our friends. And one of my friends is notorious for ordering everyone loads of beers and creamy donuts for, um, for dessert and so forth before. So if that happens, this is what I'm going to do. Um, you know, you have your, your excuse or your reason for not engaging with that straight away. Okay. And, again, and so, you know, you're tempted, you're going to be tempted at that period. This is the plan that I'm, I'm going to uh, go for. And that, yeah, and that just helps. Yeah. Planning for yeah, uh, mitigating circumstances and, and, and when your, your willpower is going to be tested. Yeah. So it's almost like there's, there's two different people inside us. There's, there's, that, there's the planning side and the rational, and then there's the other side that couldn't care less about future plans, just wants what it wants now. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 And sometimes, you know, the, 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 the obvious way to think about willpower is it's always a battle between those two people, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have to be, you know. Um, those two parts of the brain or two parts of the people are two people sometimes they can align and actually if they do align then that's the you won't need willpower so if you can get some instant gratification that satisfies your amygdala your chimp or your irrational person or whatever you want to do it within while doing your long-term valued goals then then that that's absolutely fantastic that's the that's the the, the the gold standard if you like that's what we're, we're trying to achieve but give yourself little rewards for for correct behavior yeah uh, and, and they don't have to be tangible rewards they don't but I, I just mean rewards as in some sort of pleasure within that activity okay so the, the people who genuinely love running okay to, they will be satisfying both parts of them they'll be doing their training for whatever marathon or half marathon they're doing but those people that generally get pleasure out of running as well are satisfying the instant gratification type person type aspects of their brain as well so that's the that's the optimal if you can get it yeah, I think I've tapped into that a little bit with my uh, son. So like you said, we're on lockdown, we're stuck indoors all the time. And so then trying to pry the kids away from the devices and the toys and stuff to get them outside, it can be uh, a challenge. And so I think at the 
front end of the lockdown, it was, come on, we're going to build some muscles. We're going to go for a hike or, you know, that kind of thing. But like you said, those long-term goals, especially my son's eight, like he can't understand, like my muscles look the same, you know, it doesn't, you know, he wants that instinct. So we've switched it over to, we need some vitamin D because when you go outside, like vitamin D, it makes you healthy. You need it. it and we're not getting any, we're, we're starved from vitamin D in the house. So let's go outside. And so now he says that. And so every once in a while, he'll be like, I think we need some vitamin D. I'm like, I think, I think so. Let's go, you know. So That's he can well get that somehow. <laughs> a well-trained child there. Right. <laughs> yeah, some sort of satisfaction in going out. Like going out in the sunshine is, is a nice feeling. You know, yeah, that sort right. of thing. Right, mm -hmm. right. Well, and here in California, it's even winter. Yeah, there's sun, it's fine, just go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ian, one, th one interesting thing I got from the book is that surprisingly, um, it's often when you're sort of feeling like a champion or on top that you are likely to break down and give in to impulses that are unhelpful. Like if you're feeling virtuous, you're not going to question your urges because you think you're great. So whatever you do, you give yourself a bit of latitude um, and you sort of, you know, you're happy to reward yourself. But that could be sort of the beginning of a slippery slope. Um, what did you think about that idea? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, really, that really resonated with me for, for a couple of reasons. It, um, firstly, um, I do that. Uh, so, so I was like, oh, we wow. all do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I am much more likely to have a beer if I've been for a run that day because I'm like, well, I'm healthy. You know, I can have a beer now. So, so that that was really, oh right, that's really interesting. The the second reason why it really grabbed my attention is because I wasn't um, familiar with that idea. Uh, I'd not come across it. Uh, that I, I couldn't remember it at least. And that's really interesting because it, it, that would explain. So going back to the analogy of, it being, of willpower being a muscle, um, that came from the fact that if you use self-control, if you use willpower to do something, then you will have less willpower in, on a second activity. And what this moral licensing do might, might provide a different explanation to that. So if you've used a bit of willpower to go for a run and that's made you feel virtuous, then you, you lapse in the, on the second event, the, the beer in my case or whatever. So I was really interested in that. I'm sure, I'm sure there's, um, there will be research uh, on that, but I, I hadn't come across it. So I, I was really interested in that because it provides another explanation for, for this muscle thing that was, was debunked. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, I found it really interesting. There, there's a related thing which she calls the "what the hell" effect. <laughs> yeah. So if you slip up, have your cigarette or whatever your bad habit is, um, you feel like if you've had one, why not have the whole packet? Yeah. You've already had one. You might as well let loose. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that's pretty um, relevant for now. Um, so in New Year's resolutions, people who, uh, who haven't exercised before, or haven't gone on a diet or whatever resolution it is, the natural uh, way to think about progress is, is linear. You know, just, oh, yes, I, did, I went for a run today and I was healthy today. And it just doesn't, progress just doesn't work like that. And, you know, there's also, there's, you're going to have plateaus, you're going to have lapses, you know, you're going to have your cigarette and so forth. So it's very rare that people just, become healthy or stop smoking it just doesn't happen like that but what happens is is this yeah this this catastrophizing of oh i didn't manage to go for my run today oh let's go back to normal and i'll just sit on it and it's just and it just ends um yeah and the same with your example of smoking just the, the, the smoking cessation just ends and actually telling people it doesn't have to work like that just because you didn't go today doesn't mean you're you failed in your goal you just got to expect a bit of ups and downs along the way. Of it. So yeah, that, that was a really interesting one for certainly for, for now while everyone's trying to f focus on their New Year's resolutions, I think. Yeah, that was one of my favorite parts of the book is really examining why willpower fails and when it fails and what 
um, factors that we can control to sort of set ourselves up for success as best we possibly can. So some of the things we already talked about, getting enough sleep because your willpower will fail more likely if you're tired or if you're hungry or, um, you know, or like you said, if you're rewarding yourself or you look at tiny insignificant fail and just say, what the hell? It's just, you know, never mind. I'm not a person who cooks at home. I just have to buy food every day or whatever. Um, you know, so I, I really enjoyed that part of the book of knowing sort of in advance, like you said, planning out what's going to happen when failure happens because we're human and it's going to happen. So having a, a backup plan to keep you on track, even when those small failures happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think there's this what comes out of this book for me is that there are a lot so many studies now um in this area and a lot of them are not um they're sort of counterintuitive so they're only revealed by research things like the what the hell effect and um so i think it's just this is a this is a really good area where there are sort of rules of thumb you know like folk sayings etc about willpower but um we're only ever going to um, get greater control of ourselves if we are aware of the research and all the specific little areas where we can be tripped up. And I think, um, I mean, Ian, you know it probably a ton more than we do. There must be so much research into the more serious areas like alcoholism and drug addiction and why and where exactly people you know, lapse back um, because I imagine it's in those extreme areas uh, where we can learn stuff that's sort of useful for, for you and me. Yeah, the problem is with, with the extreme stuff, I don't think you're thinking it, it, the solutions uh, lie in uh, willpower and self-control. I think the idea, you know, you, you the idea that you know people are alcoholics or drug addicts just because of a lack of self-control and willpower, I think that's that that that, that idea is gone. So certainly the the, the books like the, uh, Kelly's book and uh, these sort of lay ideas on how to improve uh, willpower and self-control, they're for the things like you know just someone who wants to lose a few pounds or someone who wants to get a bit fitter and so forth. Once you get into the um, more clinical aspects like drug addiction and alcohol, there, there's much other sort of neurochemical, behavioral, uh, developmental issues that all sort of merge together to create the alcoholism or the drug addiction and so forth. Um, so, yeah, so I wouldn't um, think about these ideas of willpower and self control in those extreme areas. I think they're a lot more complicated um, and a lot more other things uh, are, are, lead, are factors in, in, in leading to alcoholism and drug, drug addiction. And so I think actually one of those things would, would not to sort of, I think there are some generalizable principles around willpower that you can apply to different areas, but that would stop once you get to the more clinical aspects that you spoke about there. I don't think you would generalize that far. Got it. So if somebody's trying to just sort of avoid their phone more, stay off social media more, just sort of those small tailorings of their life. But then when yeah. it comes to like the physiological addiction to say an opiate or something like that, it's just a different type of thing. It's not just willpower alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, are there any other sort of more popular um, books or mainstream ones that you've come across in, in addition to Willpower Instinct that you would recommend, like I'm thinking like the Roy Baumeister book. Um, but yeah, it's, yep. it's beyond, you know, academic journal research. Yeah, so the Roy Baumeister book, I, I can't remember what it's called. So he's, he's um, the guy that really kicked off the, this interest in self-control and willpower. Think. There, were, there, were, there, was, there was research being done, but I think his ideas really sort of accelerated the work because they were really sort of quite jazzy ideas. 
and he was the he was the guy behind the um, uh, self control is a muscle um, yeah. um, theory. Um, it's called it's called different things, but the strength model or limited resources model. Um, and uh, he's still sort of uh, active in the area. He's still sort of going with that uh, explanation, but I think there's a lot more competing explanations now. Mm. For a time, probably when um, Kelly wrote the book, I think um, that was the dominant um, theory, Roy Baumeister's theory. I yeah. Think. Um, yeah, so I'm not, I, I, I tend, because I research, uh, uh, Willpower. I tend tend not to go for those those other types of, of, of books on, on self control, but there are there are a number of books uh, around on on other things about my and you can take little um, little snippets of 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 elements about willpower um, from a lot of little, little books. For example, um, you know the famous book from quite a few years ago. Now you either love it or you hate it. Four hour work. <laughs> a lot of that was look get things done in the morning you know don't don't just don't do other things that are not important okay because they will get in the way of achieving your important goals okay and so he wasn't talking about willpower self-control and temptation but nonetheless there's there's themes around that in there so i think the, the, that's a good idea and he speaks about um, you know, what's really important, write down what's important to you, okay, and focus on those goals. And so that almost that sort of taps into what Kelly was talking about, about, you know, what's, you know, um, I think it, that was the I want willpower, okay. So I think there's, there's, there's quite a lot of ideas in temptation, self-control in a whole host of books, I think. Um, another one that I quite like, well, there's two, there's the, there's the actual... Uh, thinking fast and slow is mm -hmm. by Daniel Kahneman. Yeah, we're covering that in Book Insights. Yeah, yeah. Well, perfect. That's that's a great book. I actually prefer um, the Undoing Project, which is about Daniel Kahneman. Oh. Um, uh, so the Undoing Project com really combines um, a more sort of popular media description of thinking fast and slow. With the actually story behind the research of Daniel Daniel Kahneman and, and Amos Tversky, so I think yeah, the Undoing Project for me was a more uh, interesting book because it had the story behind the research as well. But within that as well, there's all sorts of you know the way the way humans are biased towards certain things can be applied to to willpower and self control as well. So I think there's a number of books out there that may not have willpower in the title. Um, but they do speak to avoiding temptation, doing what's important, knowing what your biases are and so forth. Mm. That's great. All right. Well, I think it's probably about that time when we rate the, the book and we talk about what are the latest updates on the book and the author, that kind of thing. So um, shall we rate it? What did we think of The Willpower Instinct by Kelly McGonagall? Well, I, um, I give it a four. I mean, it's... Um... I wouldn't think it's a standout book in this area. Um, I did read the, the, the Roy Baumeister one a few years ago on willpower. Um, there's, there seems to be a ton of books uh, on it now. But, um, yeah, I think this is definitely one of the better ones. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. I'll give it a four bookmarks out of five. I think um, uh, for me, anytime we're talking the neuroscience, the physiology, where we're talking about the human body and what is innate, what's in there already, and we just need to learn how to use it, those tend to be right up my alley. I really like those. Um, yeah, uh, the only thing I would say that's not giving it the five is it's not the most... Um, compelling it's not super exciting it's not anything that's super groundbreaking like i've never heard before anything like that it's interesting enough to keep me reading but not you know mind-blowing so yeah four out of five what do you think ian um i would say when it was published yeah i'd go four out of five i'd say now i'd go a bit three i think as i said self-control has moved on quite quickly and i think yeah there would be other stuff out there but as i say it's a bit more a bit more contemporary a bit more snappier yeah, it is from two, 2012. Um, so yeah, is there any sort of more recent findings? I mean, you've talked about some, some of them a bit that sort of stood out to you in this whole 
area of research that you find interesting or is counterintuitive or yeah there's 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 research now coming out that's it it's almost uh it's almost mean it's going back to this sense of identity and beagles if you like that if you you know it's almost unfair in that people who see themselves as runners or let me know i'll take a different example Pe people see themselves as healthy people their attention is biased towards healthy things um, and they their, their attention tends to ignore unhealthy things so it's easy so for healthy people it's easy to be healthy whereas if you are not if you don't view yourself as a healthy person but you do want to be healthy it's a lot harder because you're not your biases don't lean towards the healthy things they lean towards the unhealthy things because yeah. you know, you're from the unhealthy so it's almost like it's, it's not fair the way your attention works. Um, so that's, I think, is a, is a good, um, good recent finding. And then the other one I think is a really um, um, interesting idea is the effort feels bad. Um, so when you're starting out on new uh, goals, um, try to minimize the effort. You don't want to, you don't want to, remember the effort okay so if you're starting out on a new healthy activity you know you started running you need to keep it super super easy okay otherwise the next time you go for a run you're going to remember that that was royally hard um and that will sort of you'll be tempted not to do it okay. so it's okay to start with the grandpa jog then absolutely i would recommend that until you start you know, getting confidence and being able to override that sense of effort. So I think it was, there's a guy in Canada, really, really good. He's a good researcher, but he also communicates his ideas well called Michael Inslet. And um, I think he, one of his papers was called The Effort Paradox. And it was about this. People don't like thinking about effort. But when you put effort in, you really value it. And so there's that, so there's real conflicting um, ideas behind effort that make make it very complicated. So I think that's that's really interesting sort of avenue over the next year or two. Mm. Yeah, it's it's sort of a subtle idea, but potentially extremely powerful. Mm. Um, I, I would sort of like getting towards the end, sort of um, throw in a thought that something else I that the book made me think about. I think she only mentions. Um, uh, to some extent that a willpower as a great human inheritance so it's something that we have used collectively cooperatively you know to build things to build civilization um and and to look forward in time so we tend to think about willpower as like you know a difficult area about <laughs> stopping doing things we don't like or whatever but actually it's an incredible you know asset that's helped build civilization and the, the sort of related thing of delayed gratification you know is one of our great um achievements so I, I look i like to look at this whole area in that sort of larger positive light yeah definitely the sort of that resisting well yes i could have shelter by just living in this cave or i could delay gratification and slowly build a house like that whole concept yeah <laughs> yeah exactly mm -hmm. um Max Weber, the sociologist, did this essay about 100 years ago, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. The whole part of the argument is all redundant now in terms of Protestantism or whatever. But his basic argument was that this group of German society had a greater level at the time of delayed gratification. So they had built up more economic prosperity, fortunes, better institutions, etc., um, and uh, I just think that this, this issue of delayed gratification would be very interesting if you could study it across history and how it had manifested in different cultures and settings and what it had achieved for people. It's, it's interesting. Have you, have you heard of the marshmallow experiment? I have, yes. Yeah, it's... Um, Remind yeah. us what With the that kids is. who have to resist the marshmallow, right? Exactly, yeah. And so the kids... Um, so uh, 
in, back in the 60s, I think it was, where they um, tested kids on whether, could they delay their gratification. You know, so if you don't eat, um, so there's a marshmallow in front of me here and the experiment says, oh, I'm just going to leave you. If you don't eat that marshmallow in however many minutes, I'll come back uh, and I'll give you two. And that's a classic um, delayed gratification uh, uh, experiment. What was really interesting is when they went back to those kids decades later. And, and now I'm not sure whether this research is, is one of the ones that couldn't be replicated and has been sort of, it might be a bit controversial, but nonetheless, the story is good. Um, uh, decades later, when they went back to see those kids, the ones who could delay gratification in the marshmallow experiment were more successful academically uh, in jobs and so forth. So yeah, that, 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 I think that speaks to you on a slightly smaller you know, over decades, not necessarily over over sort of history and centuries. But yeah, mm. the same idea. Just yeah, on that, just one last question: um, uh, willpower, delay gratification. Is that to what extent is it innate in a person, and to what extent is it shaped by environment? Um, it's, it's a, I'm gonna, well, it, the answer, <laughs> end of psychology to, to, to questions like that is probably the answer is both. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna slightly sit on the, uh, the fence. We all have the capacity to resist temptation. We all have willpower, okay? But it is um, also shaped by your environment. If you're constantly stressed you know, it's, it's one of the, or possibly one of the reasons why, you know, people say, you know, people in low socioeconomic status areas, um, oh, why don't they just resist? Why don't they eat healthy? Why don't they just resist this? Why don't they do, be healthy? And stuff like that. It's just a case of willpower. It's not just a case of willpower. It's because people in socioeconomic status have stuff to deal with, okay? And it's stressful and it's constantly, they're not, you know, they're, they, have, they need to focus more on immediate stuff, feeding themselves, feeding their kids, staying safe and so forth. So therefore, the, that, their environment doesn't allow their willpower to flourish and to, and to focus on other things that people in higher socioeconomic status uh, communities can. Okay, so it, it, it's both. We all have individual differences, but also it's shaped by the environment. Fascinating. Yeah, that's um, great to know. Thank you. Um, Corinne, um, uh, I think um, Kelly Mungo has written other books. I think what's so her one on exercise and... Yeah, and that's right. One. Uh, so she's got The Joy of Movement on how physical exercise can be a powerful antidote to things like depression, anxiety, loneliness. That, so that's her latest one. Um, and it seems that since this book came out, since Willpower Instinct, that's sort of been the direction she's gone is Willpower Instinct sort of examined how different things can help you build your willpower. And now it seems like she's diving deeper into those things that can help, one of which is the exercise piece of it. She also does a lot with diet. She does a lot with sleep and meditation. So she's got sort of all the um, all the different things that she recommends. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, and like latest with um, Kelly McGonigal is uh, just a year ago, she was named the first um, o visionary by Oprah of 2020. Um, so she was like awarded this because of her work specifically in helping people change their lives using these types of um, techniques. Also her 2013 TED talk was one of the top 20 viewed TED talks of all times. It's got over 20 million views as people learn to, um, so the title of that one is how to make stress your friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think whoever you, you are on the planet, you know, everyone struggles with this. So it's one of these topics that are interesting to everyone <laughs> on the planet. And part of the reason why these books um, sell so well and that people like Ian continually asked for interviews. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much, um, Dr. Ian, for coming on and asking our answering our sort of basic questions <laughs> thanks for inviting me. yes thank you it's been so great talking with you and we really appreciate you joining us here on the book lounge i think the listeners are going to be really uh, excited to hear you and and learn from an expert for once <laughs> yeah thank you so much <laughs> 
All right. Um, so that wraps it up for today. Thank you for joining us on the Book Lounge. I hope you'll uh, join us again next week. We are back in action every Wednesday, a new book of the week. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening.